Welcome back to Ear Crush, the Friday podcast for people who love listening to great stories. My co-host this week is once again Emily Beresford, the voice of the Critherian Gambit, protected by the damned, and today's short story, Bellatrex. But we're going to talk about some other things today as well. But first, Emily, I want to know when's book 21 coming out? That's, we, we got we got <laughs> book 20. That is always the question. When's the next? <laughs> when's the next? As soon as I can, uh, as soon as I can get it done, um, hopefully within the next few weeks, it will be live on Audible and ready for listeners. So I can't wait myself to get it recorded, even though I'm sad to have book 21 be done. Did you ever think we would get here? It's taken me long enough. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I think we all remember from your narrator notes in the earlier, around the end of last year when there was this bet that you made with Michael. (laughs) I think it was sort of a one woman bet. I'm not sure Michael was, was. was in on it, but you were convinced that you were going to catch him. I thought I Maybe could, but you know. <laughs> oh, you're really softening this up. You were positive. I tend to dream big. I'll, I won't, you know, it's all right. I, I fell a little short. Well, <laughs> let's be honest. <laughs> and then once that finishes, then people will want to know when payback is coming and the next one and Absolutely. the next one and the next one. As and- soon as possible. And then, of course, we've got Protected by the Dam that you're that you're also doing. And you are yes. – we were talking about this before we started recording. How far behind are you? I, you said that there – I'm eight books behind. Yeah. So I need to uh, <laughs> get moving. And there's Alpha Class. Yes. So we Alpha need to, we need well. to get – we need to get Alpha Class because those, the first two Alpha Class audiobooks were wildly popular. So yes. people have been waiting. Have they been badgering you for those? Absolutely. Very kindly. <laughs> Very kindly badgering me. I have to tell you the story that I, I heard from N.D. Roberts, um, one of the co-authors of Alpha Class. She's the one that took over from uh, T.S. Paul took the series over for the last two books. And she very – she's just the nicest, sweetest person. And she very carefully asked, when do you think we'll start making plans for the audiobook? And I'm like, well, it kind of depends because we've got to get the rest of the Cretharian Gambit done first because Emily's doing it. And she's like, oh, my God, Emily's going to do this. This is so fantastic. <laughs> Well, I'm so excited. I can't wait to I can't wait to get my eyes on it. I, I think those are going to we'll, we'll probably do book three pretty soon. I expect it'll be coming out not far after book 20, Cretharian Gambit book 21, probably before payback. If I sure. for, for those of you who want to kill me for saying that, <laughs> you just have to wait. I'm going to continue to blame that on Emily. <laughs> Send all emails to me. (laughs) And you don't just record our books, which I find astonishing. I don't know how you have time to record other books, but we mentioned the first time you were on, you were nominated for an Audi Award for something that you had done with a group of other authors. What's that like, working with a bunch of authors on a book? It it was fantastic. I'm sorry, narrators, a bunch of narrators. Yep. Well, it was also uh, several authors as well. So there were lots of different voices involved, and it was it was remarkable. And not only working on the audiobook itself, but uh, after the fact and the connections that were made through narr- narrators as well as the authors, mm-hmm. and we are all in touch and kind of keeping in touch. And there's friendships that have blossomed from that project. So it's been. It's been really, really awesome. Do you enjoy doing the multi-narrator books? I do. I I love listening to them after the fact as well, Uh, just hearing everybody's take on the different stories. And uh, it's all single voice narration, Mm -hmm. so it's not uh, multi-casted throughout, you know, several voices. uh, It's not back and forth. No, no, no. So uh, they do do, obviously, those the audiobooks, but this one was each story had its own narrator. Okay. And I'm, I'm curious from listeners because I'm, I'm hearing more and more of these audiobooks. I'm listening to one now where each chapter is a different point of view character, and so there are three different narrators, and I have no idea how it's going to come together in the end. I, I find it's... it awkward as a listener when – 
there's dialogue and it's going back and forth between two narrators, but I kind of sure. like the shift back and forth um, between chapters. That's kind of cool. Yeah. Yes. Yes. It's very cool. And I love listening to those books where the different point of view are different narrators. So, so what you guys out there listening, I would, I would love to, I would love to know what you think. Um, let us know in the Cartharian Gambit uh, Facebook page or send an email to Steve at lmbpn.com. I'd really love to know because it's something that we're thinking about doing, but I think we'd have to write books specific to that type of narration to make it work and, and work well. But it would be kind of an exciting project. Absolutely. You guys are doing it all. So you <laughs> might trying, as well add that on. <laughs> we're trying to do it all. We're trying to do it all. So what's, what's a cool project that you have worked on over the last six months outside of ours, something that you might recommend to people? Well, it depends on what everybody's into. Um, I do a you lot of- You know what people that listen to this fantasy. show are into. I do a lot of fantasy and sci-fi. Um, I, a series that's near and dear to my heart is the Miriam Black series by Chuck Wendig. And that was the very first book I ever recorded was Blackbirds. Really? Uh, yes. The So I don't love listening to book one because I've come a long way since then. <laughs> <laughs> but... Um, but I really love uh, Chuck's writing style. He's got his own voice, absolutely. Oh my gosh! And do you do you do you ever read his blog? I do a little bit, yes. And I he's got a very unique voice, no matter what he's doing. Uh huh. So you can kind of tell when it's a Wendig, I would say. Yeah, he's a fascinating yeah. character, and for, and for people out there that don't know who he is, he was one of the first indie writers that was really out there beating the indie author drum and beating it very aggressively and uh, so pretty much every indie author who's come along since then has read his stuff and has been inspired by his stuff he's he's uh he's a character absolutely he does a lot for indie publishing yes absolutely you're right Okay, uh, you ready to go to work again? We'll see if we can we can trick people into thinking that you're going into the booth and narrating this live. We should do one that way. Oh man, <laughs> it might take us hours. <laughs> <laughs> that would be fun. We should actually do it. <laughs> we could do a live reading. Oh man. All that right, we're be... gonna do it. We're gonna do it. <laughs> Sounds good. I'm gonna have somebody write something that's just the right length, and we'll do it. That that'll be fun. All right, so let's let's get into Bellatrex. Mama, Elena tipped her head back with a groan of frustration. Uh, let it be. No, her mother flipped the suitcase closed on Yelena's hand. Her eyes were fierce. You shouldn't go. Yelena did not even consider that. Alec is in trouble. So call the authorities. I got you the phone number. Her mother held out a scrap of paper. I'm going myself. Yelena took the piece of paper. And I'll call the authorities. But something is very wrong, and I am not going to just sit here. She looked at Bellatrix. Even Trix knows something is wrong. She meant it as a joke, but her mother swallowed hard and her face went grave. Mama, Mama, I was joking. You can't go. Her mother's voice was even fiercer now. Not out there. You stay here, where it's civilized. What does that even mean? Elena flipped the suitcase back open and shoved a stack of shirts into it. She wasn't paying much attention to what she was packing. Hopefully, she'd have something usable when she reached Vatra Dorni, the ski resort. When I was in this city, you kept telling me to come back here because this city wasn't good for me. She grabbed a pair of shoes. This city wasn't good for you. I thought if you came back, you would find a nice man. Oh, for the love of... Elena pointed a shoe at her mother. I am not having that argument, too. I am perfectly happy right now. She wasn't, of course, but she was definitely not going to tell her mother that. Yelena's mother kept telling her to meet a nice boy and settle down. And while Yelena had no intentions at all of settling down, sometimes she did feel a strange yearning for something... more. A boyfriend? Maybe. The idea had some appeal... But it was more than that, and she could never put a finger on it. She had her boxing and a job at the kennel and Bellatrix. She didn't want to admit that she wasn't happy. Anyway, right now it didn't matter. What mattered was her brother. Yelena, I am begging you. 
her mother pleaded. What do you want? Yelena rounded on her mother, her voice yelling in frustration. This is your son out there. Why aren't you begging me to go help him? He's in danger. I don't want to lose you too, her mother yelled back. It is dangerous. It's more dangerous than you know. There are things out there that you shouldn't know about, that we moved here long ago so you'd never know about them, to keep ourselves safe. Yelena stopped. She wanted to brush off her mother's words and yell at her about Alec being in danger, but the hair on her arms was standing up. Her mother was genuinely terrified. She had always scoffed at superstition, now looked like she was really afraid. Mama, what kind of things? Yelena asked, her anger chilled. Her mother looked away. She clearly wanted to lie. She regretted having said anything. Oddly, her eyes came to rest on Bellatrix, and that seemed to help her decide. Vatra Dorni is near where our family came from long ago. I tried to keep Alec from going there, but you know your brother. Tell him not to do something. Elena gave a little laugh, but it was forced. Her mother was trying to make a joke, but fear was coming off of her in waves. There were rumors about our family. My family, not your father's. Her mother was twisting her hands. They said, Mama, they said we were changers. Her mother threw the words out, as if even speaking them was an act of courage. Changers? Skin changers. Wolves. Her mother's lips shaped a word silently, and then she said it aloud. Vexelbolk. That's what the Germans call them. Yelena stared at her mother. The woman was clearly going crazy. Mama, that's a story for babies. It's true. Her mother looked up. Her eyes were wide. We had to leave. Something about a pack and being driven out and... It isn't safe there. There are people who aren't natural. They aren't human. Bad enough your brother goes. But you? She pointed to Bellatrix. You have some of it in you. What? Elena shook her head wearily. You're talking crazy, Mama. Mama pointed at the big black German shepherd. You can hear her talk. I hear you talk to her, answering questions. All the dogs listen to you. They all accept you as their alpha, even the ones who don't like Dimitri. He tells me about it. He doesn't know what it means, but even he can see it. Mama, I've always been good with dogs, but that doesn't mean... Her mother cut her off. Tears were shimmering in her eyes. If you go she said, shaking. I'm afraid you will never come back. There are things out there that are dangerous to you because of what you are. I have always tried to keep you from that place. Her shoulders slumped. Now you know why. Elena could see that she believed. Her mother, who always laughed at folk tales, really believed this one. But it was crazy. The world was connected now, and science had shown that none of those sorts of things were real hadn't it? These myths, they were stories for a time when people didn't know how wind whistled in the trees and called it werewolves. She shook her head. I have to go find Alec, she said flatly. He's my brother. I am not going to let him be hurt. I love you, Mama. She kissed her mother on top of her head. I'm going to be fine. She picked up the suitcase and left, Bellatrix padding along with her without a backward glance. There was no time to talk anymore. Alec was in danger. His ankle throbbed. It was an unceasing pain that he never seemed to get used to. The tiniest shift would make Teo cry out, and he soon learned that there was no way to keep from moving entirely. At one point, passing in and out of consciousness, he remembered crying. He wasn't proud of it, but this was a bad way to end. Alone, dying slowly, his wife never knowing what had happened to him. He never able to take back the harsh words he'd spoken. Some part of him wanted the pain to stop, whatever that meant. <sighs> he knew what it meant, and he told himself he was past caring whether or not he died. He kept eating snow anyway, and dragging himself slowly over the ground when he had enough strength and will to force himself to movement. He'd cracked some ribs as well as shattering the ankle. He'd managed to get all of ten feet the first night, and not much further since then. He told himself it was not far to the resort, 
but he could not make up his mind whether to go through the woods, the shorter path, or out onto the ski trail, potentially a hazard to other skiers, and visible to whoever had sent the wolf. He was sure he had seen the wolf. He was also sure, as consciousness came and went, that Virgil had hired hitmen. Ripped to shreds, the man had said, and there had been a massive wolf with claws that could do just that. And they had the wrong man. That, more than anything, spurred Teo into motion again. He had to find someone and tell them what had happened on the slope. They would think he was crazy, but that was a problem to deal with when it happened. He dragged himself over the ground, gritting his teeth in pain. It was the faintest noise that caught his attention. In fact, he could not even say what the noise was, just that the breeze in the trees seemed different somehow. He found himself terrified that the wolf had somehow learned to fly, but he knew that was ridiculous. Cursing himself, he craned his neck painfully to look up. No flying wolves. No, the truth was stranger than that. Black shapes stood out against the night sky, descending toward the resort. As they passed by overhead, Teo thought they almost looked like pods of metal. They weren't falling, though, and there didn't seem to be any sort of propulsion he could see. The tears surprised him this time. He was actually going crazy. He was going crazy, and he was going to die here. Teo rested his face on his arms, despairing, aware of the pathetically short distance he'd managed to travel, and wept. Everyone ready? Bethany Ann looked around the interior of the pod, now dressed in a high-necked black shirt beneath a light jacket, having reluctantly traded her new Lou Boutons for what Ekaterina assured her were stylish winter boots. She was reasonably enough dressed that no one would think oddly of her. They didn't need to know that she was not troubled by weather anymore. Ready. John nodded at her. At his side, Eric gave a thumbs up. Ready, came Pete's voice from the other pod. Ekaterina? Bethany Ann tapped the communications unit. Ready. Ekaterina's voice was tight with anticipation. I can't wait to get down there into the snow. I hope we have to go into the mountains to find them. What is it with you and cold? Pete sounded dubious. It's not that cold. I'm not saying I mind it. I'm just saying I don't think to myself, hmm, what could I do today? Why don't I tramp around in the cold icy snow? Bethany Ann cut off the communications with a shake of her head. Nathan was worried about Ekaterina going on a trip, but even he had to admit that she was both capable of handling herself and that she was surrounded by a good team. And it would take a heart of stone to ignore the way her face lit up when she found out Bethany Ann was taking an expedition into the mountains of Romania. At least he was smart enough not to say it around his mate. The pods deposited them near one of the buildings, conveniently out of the line of sight of any of the ancient security cameras. Once everyone was down, the pods went back up in the air, out of sight. Bethany Ann crunched through the snow toward the resort. Everyone listen for any strange stories, she said over her shoulder. Remember, the most reliable people can be the ones no one believes. You know, the ones who actually admit they've been seeing giant wolves. When in doubt, she pointed behind her. Let Ekaterina do the talking. Ekaterina grinned. That's right, she rubbed her hands in anticipation. None of you speak like a local who tended bars. Let me find out what's going on. She continued talking, adding a rough accent to her voice. Like leading lambs to a pre-college slaughter. Bethany Ann laughed and looked into the trees, where Asher was slipping through the underbrush like a ghost. And you stay hidden. The last thing we need is for some tourist to freak out and call the cops to shoot a wolf. Emilion wrenched the curtains back and watched the bound man flinch from the light. He wanted to be in wolf form, but he did not trust anyone else to interrogate this man or hurt him enough. The client had been very specific. This man was to know just who had hired Emilion and his crew and was to realize that he had been outplayed. He had been foolish going to the ski resort alone. He had been predictable. For that and a multitude of other sins, he would pay with pain, and with his life. Emilion did not ask what the other sins were. He did not particularly care. So, he smiled humorlessly. The man was watching him. 
black hair, gray eyes. He smelled interesting, a single note of something Emilion could not quite catch. Not important. You were foolish, he observed. You were warned what would happen. The man swallowed. He had been watching Emilion's face, and he looked around himself desperately. He was tied to a chair in the center of the room, stripped of his ski gear. The marks of Emilion's claws had not been washed. They stood out vividly on his pale skin, though strangely, they already seemed to be healing. His face was bruised from where Cesar had hit him, but that mark too was fading. Cesar must have been losing his touch. It was good that Emilion had killed him. Who are you? the captive finally asked. Who I am is not important. I am here because you, unfortunately, made an enemy, Emilion explained. He picked up a scalpel and savored the fear in the man's eyes. It was amusing, really. The scalpel could not do nearly as much damage as his own claws, but humans were weak and afraid of little things. He walked over to the man and paused, letting the man's fear rise, and then plunged the scalpel into his upper arm. He smiled as the man screamed, as Emilion shrugged. I told you, you were warned, he repeated. The man's head lolled, and he pulled it up with an effort. He had gone gray with pain. Who uh, sent you? His voice was a rasp. Virgil, he told us where you would be skiing. He told you that you would be ripped to shreds if you didn't listen to him. I don't... No, Virgil. Liar. Emilion hit him in the face and snarled in disappointment when he saw that the man was unconscious. He pulled the scalpel out of his victim's arm and tossed it onto the tray. God for damned. Now he would have to wait until the man woke up again. Thank you. Elena smiled at the bus driver as she made her way off. Oh, don't worry, she said as the woman began to stand up. I'll get my bag myself. You're a good kid, the woman smiled at her. You deserve this vacation. Have fun skiing, dearie. Elena hoped her smile hadn't frozen too obviously. I will. She was hardly going to confide in this woman that her brother had been lost and might be in serious danger. She dragged her suitcase out of the side compartment and went back to give the woman a thumbs up. Thanks again. She hefted the bag as the bus drove away into the night and then looked to the forest where a shadow waited patiently among the trees. I'll be back soon. She had no idea if Bellatrix could hear her. Don't kill too many rabbits. She thought she heard the chuff of the dog's laughter and smiled. She had not been able to bring Bellatrix on the bus, but she sensed that the dog had enjoyed making her way through the forest from the train station nearby. At the doors of the hotel, she paused and took a deep breath. Alec might be here, she told herself. He might be inside. Maybe he had taken a fall and sprained his ankle, but they'd brought him right back and he'd be hanging out, flirting with the bartender. Maybe everything was fine and she was just overreacting. She'd had plenty of time on the train to wonder if he was just going to laugh at her when she showed up. Somehow, she knew that wasn't the case. She heard laughter nearby and spotted a group walking through the trees. Tourists, probably, wandering through the forests of Romania at night and telling one another ghost stories about vampires. Elena rolled her eyes and made her way through the glass doors and up to the elegant desk. A pretty blonde woman smiled at her. Hello, I'm Petra. She frowned, as if trying to remember something. You look familiar. That made things easier. Ah, uh, actually, my brother is staying here. Elena tried not to look sick with fear as she asked the question. Alec Nikolov, is he still here? When the woman's face fell, Yelena gripped the desk to keep herself upright. Oh, no. He, ah. Uh... Petra was twisting her hands now. She looked toward the door that must go to the manager's office. Let me get, just tell me. Yelena knew her voice was too high, too scared. Did something happen to him? The woman hesitated, but she couldn't resist the plea in Yelena's eyes. He went out early this morning, she explained. Very early. It was just him and one other skier on the slopes. Neither of them, uh, neither of them have been back all day. No one has seen them. She swallowed hard. We sent out tons of patrols. We have tried to find them, I promise. 
but they're nowhere on the trail. It was as if a yawning void had opened beneath Yelena's feet. She wanted to sob. Dimly, she heard herself speaking. It's probably nothing. Maybe he's just at a pub nearby. Petra nodded eagerly. Maybe. We haven't asked in the village. We should do that. I'll... I'll handle it. Yelena heard the group behind her enter the hotel. They were still laughing and bantering. She thought fast, biting her lip. Could I, uh... Could I get a key to his room? He said he booked a double. It was just the one bed. Petra shook her head regretfully. She had started the lie, and now she had to continue it. Maybe there was a clue in Alec's room, after all. Well, then I'm going to get some sleep, and he can sleep on the couch, Yelena announced. Isn't that just like a brother, asking me out here and not remembering to book a room for me? Petra laughed at that. She pulled something up on the computer and selected a key. Just like my brother, for sure. Here you go. I'll tell him you're here if he comes back. And to let you sleep. Thanks. Elena tried to smile. She took the key and hefted her bag over her shoulder. The pain was sudden and blinding, like a knife stuck into her upper arm. She doubled over with a cry. It hurt. It hurt so much. She was sobbing with it. Her knees had given out. And a second later, horrified, she realized that she had thrown up. She heard a howl from outside and the stab of Bellatrix's worry. Don't, don't come in. She could hardly form the thought. She couldn't even see it hurt so much. Bellatrix tended to unsettle people with how big she was. Yelena could not bear it if something happened to the dog because of her. Hey, hey now. A man's voice, speaking English. Gentle hands helped her to a chair. When her vision cleared, Yelena's jaw dropped open. The man in front of her was one of the most gorgeous guys she had ever seen. He was crouching, but when he stood up, he would be far taller than even she or Alec. And he was ripped. The guys at the boxing gym were nothing compared to him. A moment later, a woman's face swam into view. Hello, she smiled and switched to Romanian. Are you a local? Yeah. Yelena nodded at her gratefully and gave a pained look at where Petra was cleaning up the vomit from the floor. Her face flamed. She'd just thrown up in front of the most gorgeous man she'd ever seen. I, uh, are you all right? I mean, really all right? No, my brother is out there alone and someone is hurting him. But what could this woman do about that? Yelena tried to smile, for all that she felt tears in her eyes. I'm just, uh... I'm really tired. I'm so sorry. Thank you for helping me. Can you thank him, too? She nodded her head at the gorgeous man. She couldn't bring herself to meet his eyes. I'll get out of your way. She sniffed, trying to hold back a sob that was bubbling up. The man squeezed her fingers. He looked genuinely worried. She was going to burst into tears if she stayed here. I have to go. Yelena pushed her way up and fairly ran for the elevator. Wait! The woman called after her. She ran, too, and laid a hand on Yelena's shoulder as the elevator doors opened. My name's Ekaterina. You can ask at the front desk if you need help with anything, okay? Thanks. Yelena hunched her shoulders. She smiled as the doors closed, but just so that the woman would feel better. No one could help her with this. She slumped back against the wall of the elevator. Bellatrix's worry radiated in her mind. We need to find Alex soon. Yelena thought. Bellatrix's instant agreement didn't make her feel any better. I'm worried about her. John dumped the bags on the floor by one of the beds. The team had gotten four rooms, but everyone had crowded into this one for now. Something about her. Well, she didn't just seem sick or anything. I'm worried it's more. Maybe she has migraines, Ekaterina suggested. Maybe, but she looked very upset. John frowned. He couldn't get the black-haired woman out of his head. It wasn't that he was thinking of cheating on Jean. Even if he hadn't been sure she'd kill him painfully if he did so, he had no desire to do so. The black-haired woman had just seemed like she was in over her head. It got to him that he hadn't been able to help her. I feel like something more was wrong. I think you're right. Pete exchanged a look with Bethany Ann. How so? John looked at them both. 
Should we go make sure she's all right? Is she in danger here? It was Bethany Ann who answered. I don't think she's in danger right now, but she might be soon. She's a Vexelbog. What? Ekaterina shook her head. If she were a Vexelbog, she would have smelled you guys, me, Pete. She would have known there was something different about everyone. She would have had some pack mannerisms. She's not full Vexelbog. Pete nodded his head. Distant ancestor, I'd guess. But she's got some of the nanocytes. At a guess? He shrugged. She heals fast. That's usually the only part that sticks when the bloodline gets diluted. That's and being crazy. But she doesn't seem crazy, though. So what was wrong with her? John asked. He sat down in one of the chairs, frowning. She looked really upset. I still think you're all overreacting. You've clearly never had a migraine, Ekaterina interjected. They're terrible. She might just have been tired and... You're thinking like a tour guide, Bethany Ann told her gently. This woman's not a normal tourist. I didn't want to look into her head without a reason, but it's clear she's not just here for a visit. And she was afraid. I could smell that. Also, there's more to this. Pete and I talked to the receptionist. Two people went missing here today, and one of them was that girl's brother. Ekaterina looked around herself. You think she came here to find him? How would she know he was in danger? It is possible that he might also have the nanocytes. If he's got them too, she might know if he's in trouble. Pete frowned. I hate to say this, because she seems nice, but he might also be one of the guys we're looking for. We know they're operating around here, and we know they're weak Vexelbog. He might just be stronger than she is, and she doesn't know what he's a part of. Some of the old packs in the underworld, they have old rules. He might be marrying her off to someone to get them to be loyal. And even if the bloodline is thin, there's a possibility it might breed a strong child. Well, then it's our job to save her, John argued. The underworld should have had the decency to die out. We are not just going to let them sell people. Bethany Ann spoke up. If her brother was selling her off, that still doesn't explain why he is missing. She walked over to the window, frowning. She stared out at the trees and the snow, crisp under a clear sky. There were too many parts of this that didn't quite fit together, and she didn't like it. Gabrielle had mentioned to be wary of the people here. Was it possible that the girl was one of the people they were looking for, meant to gain their sympathy? Hmm, Bethany Ann didn't think so. The fear and pain she'd felt rolling off the girl had seemed sudden, beyond the girl's control. There had been no awareness when Bethany Ann and her team walked in, as they could expect if the girl was meant to be a distraction or plant. Something told her this girl was for real. And her eyes caught on something in the woods, and she swore under her breath. Son of a horse humping, she murmured. What is it? The rest came to look out the window as well, and there was a collective gasp. In the moonlight, Asher's fur shone, and he was nose to nose with a massive black German shepherd. The dog looked small next to Asher, but Bethany Ann and the rest knew just how big Asher was. This dog, for a normal, mortal being, was big. Bethany Ann pressed her hand against the glass, narrowing her eyes as he reached out with his mind. Her eyes still closed, she told them about the dog. It's hers, the girl, and it's not a normal dog. It used to be, but she's changed it. It's starting to absorb what she is. On purpose? Pete frowned. No, Bethany Ann shook her head. I don't think she understands what she is. The dog knows, I think. She frowned in concentration as she searched through the dog's thoughts. The dog trusts her. She's not mean to it. She smiled as he saw the black-haired woman through the dog's eyes. The woman had named it, trained it. She could see food held in a palm, and a ready smile and a treat when the puppy sat or lay down or came to heal. She's a good person, this one. If her brother is part of all of this, then he's nothing like her. And if she is looking for him, Ekaterina bit her lip. She's in danger, isn't she? Yup. Bethany Ann tapped her fingers on the windowsill. And we're not going to let anything happen to her. She turned away from the window. Pete, you keep watch. She might try to leave tonight. John, please speak with the receptionist and see if she knows where the sketchy people around here hang out. She walked to her suitcase. I think I'm going to go pay them a visit as soon as we find out. 
Hopefully, we can deal with them before this girl goes out looking for her brother. Thank you, Emily Beresford. As we mentioned during the intro, Emily is hard at work on Cartharian Gambit Book 21 and will then move directly to Alpha Class Book 3 for those of you who have been waiting for that. But as you know, we've got a lot more going on than just those two series. This past week, we've had two new audiobook releases, including Liberation, Book 4 in the Bad Company series from Craig Martell and Michael Anderley, and just yesterday, Bring the Pain, Book 4 in the <laughs> really cool, unbelievable Mr. Brownstone series from Michael Anderley was released on audio. On the ebook front, we continue to be really busy, but we've got something kind of special coming out on Monday. A collaboration between most of our Age of Magic authors who combined to write Etheric Apocalypse, which features many of your favorite Age of Magic characters. I'm looking forward to reading that one, which comes out on Monday. Well, that's it for this longer than usual edition of Ear Crush. Thanks for hanging in there with us. We'll be back again next Friday as we work towards the exciting conclusion to Bellatrex. <laughs> <laughs>